Hello, my friends. Jacob is here once again. Thank you for pressing play, for spending some quality time with me. This is going to really make a lot of people just... It's going to encourage a lot of people. It's going to probably freak out a lot of people. This is so strange and so wonderful and so eye-opening that it's taken me, you know, days to process this. The day that we're in, the day that we're in was spoken about many, 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 many years ago, thousands of years ago, long time ago, and spoken of in a book that is known as the Megillah. For a lot of people, let's, you know, study the Jewish faith or the Hebrew faith. It's the Megillah, it's a, the scroll, it's the book of Esther. And it has a lot to do with the holiday that is coming up called Purim. But what is truly amazing about this incredible journey that we're about to go on is the fact that this story may literally be playing out now. And that tells us what's going to happen next. So I hope you're buckled up. How you doing? Okay, welcome to the show. For those of you that are new, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. You'll be happy that you did. This is very important. Hitting that like button and leaving a comment. You know, telling people about the channel, it's super important, especially today. Today, people need God. They do. And they need to know, especially, what God is saying. And God is speaking very clearly today. I don't know if you've been on the channel for a long time. You know that we've watched all of these biblical stories playing out again and again and again, and almost in order, the book of Revelations, as well as the Old Testament. Now, I've spoken about the book of Esther. And I'm going to give you a much deeper meaning of what this story is about and how it's directly related to all of you and how it's connected to today's events. You can stick around for the rest of the show for that one because that's, that's, that's going to be mind-blowing. But the spiritual significance to the Book of Esther is, is so, so incredibly important, especially since Purim, which is the holiday that is celebrated all over Israel. You've probably seen pictures of people dressing up. Some people call it the, uh, the Jewish Halloween, which really minimizes it and uh, trivializes it. Because Purim, um, which is a loose translation of the word lot or casting of lots, it's kind of like, you know, you don't know what to do. Sometimes I, I, I flip through the Bible. I want to figure out, hey, what, what do I need to know? And I just flip through, right? Well, they cast lots. That was kind of like, well, what day should we do this on? Let's cast lots. And the day that they came up with basically loosely translates to like March 7th, I guess. This year, Purim is... great uh, anticipation for the days ahead because when I reveal all the intricacies of this story to you and I tie it into today's events I think it's going to be pretty clear that the people that have been serving God for a while this is your moment and it's coming it's coming right now I know it looks dark and it looks bleak and it looks scary it looks like, you know, just the whole world has been turned over to evil. Nothing makes sense anymore. Everything's backwards. But the story of Esther is going to set that straight. So let me get into the story for you. Let me, let me, um, let me tell you about this amazing, remarkable story that's find, found in the Old Testament, if you don't know it. There is this great king. His name is King Azuerish. Uh, some people say that this king, Azuerish, was also uh, Xerxes, if you... Uh, if you saw the 300 series, you know, with the uh, the 300, you know, Sparta, where he kicks the guy into the well. And then there they have the 300 men that fight the, you know, Xerxes. There's a picture of Xerxes right there, the king, the king of Persia. 
at the time, you had just three kings. You had Nebuchadnezzar, right? You had, uh, and you had, uh, you had Xerxes, or you had Asuerus. We're going to deal with Asuerus. The story starts off, and he's psyched, right? He's in charge of now like 127 provinces. He's, he's very powerful, and he throws this party. Throws a huge party, right? Because he's so awesome, he's so powerful, and it lasts for like six months. A huge party, big banquet. And as he's throwing this party, now this guy's married, right? He's a king. Vashti, Queen Vashti. At the same time, she throws like a little, like she just for the ladies, she throws a little party too. But everybody's drinking. The idea was you could drink as much wine as you want. Now this is all spiritually significant because every story in uh, the scriptures, it, it has a literal representation and it has a prophetic representation, which means you know, where it plays out in our daily lives and possibly in the days to come. But it also has a spiritual representation, which means what it means to us spiritually speaking, because that's the, 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 the spirit of the story is what gives life, according to scripture, not the letter, the literal story. But I think the Apostle Paul said it, it kills. It kills the spiritual significance of it. If you spend your time worrying about whether there was a literal boy who cried wolf in a literal wolf in a literal town, and if you, you focus your energy on that and you don't focus your energy on the spirit of the story, what the wolf represents, what the boy represents, and what exaggerating means, you, you lose, the, uh, you die, spiritually speaking. You don't learn anything, you don't grow, you don't enter into that wisdom, which is, as the scriptures say, a tree of life. Now this is important to note because the book of Esther is one of two books in the scriptures that doesn't mention God. Strange, right? Doesn't mention God at all. But the story is so significant that today, when they celebrate Purim, which is what's coming up, it's a holiday. As I said, it's a holiday of just great, it's just, it's, it's awesome. Party and, you know, feasts, you drink, you have a good time, you celebrate, because that was the day that God delivered the Jews, that delivered the Hebrews from the enemies of the Jews. Haman and his, his group of individuals, which, believe it or not, sort of ties into today. We're going to get into that in a second. So King Ahasuerus throws this great spectacle, this great party. And along the way, they start talking about who the most beautiful woman is, the story goes. And he's like, my queen is Vashti's the, she's the best looking. And then he says, bring Queen Vashti so everybody can check her out. Everybody can see how my queen is the best looking, the most beautiful, the most awesome queen there is. You know what Vashti does? Vashti's, just, Vashti's like, ah, ah, you know, you don't boss me around. I'm the queen. I'm not coming to you. Yeah, I'm going to stay where I am. I'm having a good time with the ladies. Forget it. Tells the messengers, forget it. I'm not coming. So it's a big disappointment, right? And it's uh, the, the, the king, Asuerus or Xerxes, whoever he is, whichever name you want to go by. He, he's got egg on his face now. He looks, he looks like his queen just totally disrespected him. So there is a, a big to-do about this because everybody's like, you know, whispering off to the side, did you see what just happened, right? Now this is a problem, right? Because the uh, the elders, the people that are close to Xerxes or Asuerus, the, the close to the king, they're like, this is gonna be a problem. You know, this is gonna be a problem because it's not just you. Now they see the queen do this to the king, all the women everywhere are gonna do this to their husbands. <laughs> they're gonna be like, I don't wanna come to your party. I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. If the queen can disrespect the king, this you've just ruined it for everybody, king. So the king's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So they uh, they tell they tell him, they go, this is what you got to do. You got to banish her. You got to get rid of her. You got to say, forget it. She doesn't want to show up. She doesn't want to show up to the banquet. Forget her. Cast her off. She's no good to you. We'll find you another one. So the king listens to everybody and he's like, you know what? Heck with Vashti, right? Now I want to tell you what the spiritual meaning of all this is. The king in scripture is always symbolic of the king of kings, which would be which would be God, which would be Christ, okay? So you have this picture of Christ, okay? And then you have the queen, which would be the bride. See, now we're in scripture, we're called the bride of Christ. It's a relationship. The spirit of God would be the male and the uh, the female would be the soul of man or, or uh, it would be us. We're the bride of Christ. We become one with the father. Okay, in a in union. So 
the Lord takes his throne. He's like, okay, I'm in charge. He calls his queen in and his queen doesn't show up. It's sort of like today, sort of like today. Today's the big day, right? Here we are a couple of years after that great sign, the 2017 sign, the Revelation 12 sign. Here we are a couple of days later, right around the time when people should be waking up, coming to the knowledge of the truth. They should be presenting themselves to the great king for the, for the banquet that awaits, the spiritual banquet that is, awaits us all, the kingdom of God that God is calling. And Vashti's like, nah, that's all right. I'm not going to come. I'm not going to come. It's a, sim it's a symbol of carnal religion. It's a symbol of, of politics. It's like, I'm going to do it. I don't need you. I'm going to do it my way. But the king's like, uh-uh, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to get somebody else. And that's just newsflash, by the way. That's all of us. That's all a, a lot of you that are watching. We, we've now been called to this banquet. We've now been called to the king to become the bride of Christ, if you will. So Ajuerus, he's like, he's like, you know, I need, I need a queen. What am I going to do? And he, of course, listens to his, the, the people, his right-hand men. And they say, you should have a beauty contest. You should have a beauty contest, right? <laughs> we'll get the most beautiful, you'll get the most beautiful, and then you choose. And so the, the way it worked was, you know, people everywhere would be sending in their ladies. So they become part of the harem, and then... For about 12 months, they'd be going through, you know, lessons, how to be queenly, you know, how to be uh, dressed up nice, and they get the perfumes, and they probably worked out, and they probably, they're, they're, they're being refined so that they can be ready to be in the presence of the king, sort of like what we're going through now. We're being refined. We're going through the testing so that when we're finally called in to the king's chamber, we're ready. We're ready to go. So now, one of the people that get in here is a, uh, is a young Jewish girl. Her name's Esther. Now, why is this important? Okay, so the Jews had already been carried off. Remember we just did a show with uh, Nebuchadnezzar about the, uh, where I did this plea, hoping that, you know, that the president would hear what I was saying and would repent and would really just come to the Lord so that the Lord would perhaps restore things because that's what we want. We want our leaders to be godly, right? So Nebuchadnezzar was a great picture of that. Well, they were carried off into, um, you know, they were carried off because of this, because, you know, that's what happens when they conquer. So you have this one guy, you have Mordecai, and it's kind of like, some people say it's Mordecai's sort of like Esther's uncle, okay? He adopted her. He adopted her. He's basically taking, he's his, his, his ward, right? She, he, she, he has to take care of her, and he says, you should, because you're so good looking, you should go in there. And she does, right? And she's, uh, she's accepted. Here's the thing. Right? This is uh this is a big deal. So now Mordecai, he's worried about his girl. So he's she's checking in her, checking in on her and seeing how things are going. He's he's always at the gate. He's always at the gate. He's saying, Hey, how's my uh how's my niece doing? How's my little girl doing? Is she doing okay in there? He's asking. Mordecai was known to be a very, very devout Jew. He was he was known to be a very, very devout rabbi, if you will. He was almost a prophet. They consider him to be a prophet in scripture. So Esther's in her training. She's, you know, she's getting ready to be presented to the king and everything else. And she, um, you know, Mordecai told her though, just listen, you know what? They don't like the Jews. They don't like us. They're not big fans of us. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be telling anybody that you're Jewish. I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't say that you're part of, you know, of, of the tribe. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you, uh, just keep it to yourself. Just keep it on the down low, right? So she listens to him. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't say anything. And, and when she's finally brought to the king, when she's finally brought in to, to the king to see the king, you know what? And this pleased the king big time. I shared something about this on Twitter. This. Because here you have a picture of God, right? Asking for his bride. Where's my bride? You know, you got the virus of the crown in the land. You got a lot of bad stuff going on in the land. It's like now you're supposed to come out of the ark. You're right. Now's the day. It's a new heaven. It's a new earth. Now, where's my bride? And Vashti's like, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I don't want to come. I don't want to come. So he's like, find me another. Find me another and prepare him and get him ready. So here's little Esther. And then Esther comes in, right? And Esther was smart. She listened to the eunuchs who were in charge of getting her ready. And when she was brought in, it was kind of like customary. So the king would say, what do you want? Right? You're in the running to be my queen. What do you want? Anything you want, I'll give it to you. 
up to the half of my kingdom, something like that. What do you want? You know what Esther says? It's so beautiful. This is what I shared. I want what you want from me. I want your will for me. What do you want to give me? That's what I want. I want your will, Lord. That's what she says, just like Jesus said. Not my will, Lord, but yours. She didn't come saying, I want a new car. I want a new this. I want a new job. I want to, I want to have a, a viral video where I get millions of subscribers. She didn't want any of that. She's like, I just want to do your will. And guess what that did? That pleased the king big time. He was like, put the crown on her head. That's the one. That's the one who's going to be my queen. Put the crown on her head. Forget Vashti. She's done. Esther's my new queen. Esther's my new queen. All because she just wanted to do what the king wanted her to do. It's kind of like when you're faced with a, an overwhelming amount of stress in your life and you just don't know what to do, you know, and you set your prayer. It's like, instead of saying, will you take it away? Will you please? Will you make mix it? It's more like, what do you want from me to learn? What should I learn from this? What do you want from me, Lord? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to be better? It's, that's what pleases God. Because God has, he gives us the desires of, you know, your heart. He gives you the desires of your heart, so he's placed it within you already for a reason. But, you know, you, if, if it's for selfish gain, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. But if you seek the truth, and you seek the kingdom of God, and you seek just to do God's will in your life, whew, now's the day when you are gonna be crowned. That doesn't mean that everything's gonna be easy, right? Because at this point in time now, you know, she, she hasn't seen the king for a while, right? It was great when she went in there and everything was great, but he hasn't called on her like a month. Now, in the meantime, something else goes down. You got this new guy in the ranks. His name's Hammon. Hammon, yeah, Hammon. Sounds a lot like human. Actually, the, 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 the word for Hammon I believe the Hebrew word for Haman, it's, it's also found in the story of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was when they went to go eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, Haman is connected to the action of eating of that tree of, of good and bad. Ironic, right? So you have a symbol of carnality in just the name, Haman. Haman was exalted. Haman was placed in charge of everything. Haman was like a, a descendant of Amalek, which, by the way, they hated the Jews. They, did, they were like terrible. They hated them. They wanted them wiped out. They, didn't, they were never friendly with them. So when Haman came in, right, and he was he exalted up, a picture of the carnal man being put in charge of the system and charred everything. Oh, I'm so great. Look at me. I'm Haman. So much so that, that everywhere he wanted, he wanted everybody to bow down to him. Everybody to do exactly what Haman said he should. You do this, you do that, or else. Because I'm Haman, the king's guy. Mordecai. Mordecai, which, by the way, the name has to do with, uh, it has to do with the sweet savor. It's a uh, picture of incense. It's a picture of, of total sacrifice to God and the things of God. Mordecai was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not bowing down to you. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm going to serve the living God, and I'm not going to serve you. Now, Haman had a big problem with this. Okay, while well, everybody else is bowing down every time he comes through, when Haman's at the gate waiting to see, check on Esther, you know, Haman walks by and he just stands there like this. I'm sure that's exactly the way he looked. But he stood there. He was, I'm not going to bow down to you, right? Mordecai serves the living God. He knows just what Esther knows. Your will, Lord, not mine. He didn't like that guy. He didn't like the Jews at all, in fact. Didn't like him at all. 
big, big, big problem with the Jews. And it was such a problem that, you know, he just wanted, he wanted them all dead. Yeah, so that's what he kind of sets out to do. He sets out to kill everyone that is like Mordecai. It wasn't good enough for Haman to just take Mordecai out. No, 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 we had to take out his people too. I want all of them done too. So Haman, who has the ear of the king, king's got bigger things going on right now in his life, right? He's, right, he's got, a, he's got like all these provinces. He's got, a, he's got a rule over all this stuff. So Haman's like, there are these people. They, they, they don't serve the, the gods that uh, other people serve. They don't, they, don't, they don't have the same ways as we do. And I gotta tell you something, they're gonna be a problem. They're gonna rise up against you. They don't believe in serving you. And uh, Haman was making up some lies. Haman was like, you know what? They're a problem. They're like, uh, you know, they're gonna come after you. They're not the kind of guys that you want. They're really bad. They're like those people that we hear about in, in the newspapers now, right? Domestically, they could probably terrorize you. You see what I'm doing here? How I'm tying everything in? They're a problem. We got to get rid of them. Goes to the king. King's like, here you go. He takes off his signet ring. Go do what you got to do. Go do what you got to do, Haman. Right? Go do what you got to do. Right? Because he's, you know, it's, he trusted Haman just like we trust our egos. We listen to, we think that we know best, right? But the ego is not serving the things of God, and that's a problem. So I want to put this in terms that you can understand, okay? So Haman would be like a world leader, like we could say like Joseph Biden, right? And uh, he's got a problem with a, a certain group of individuals, him and, you know, so they set out to just, they just, just want to destroy him, you know? You, you can't have business, you can't do this, you can't be on this platform, you can't be on that platform, you got to silence them. But, you know, we just got to get rid of them. We just got to get rid of them. They got to be done, right? But see, Haman doesn't know that one of their own is married to the king, like is the apple of the king's eye, Esther. Esther's a Jew, right? Nobody knew this, except for Mordecai. Mordecai, who, by the way, when he caught wind of all of his stuff, right, he's like, he sends word to his, his niece, not really his niece, but his ward, the one that he raised, the one that he took care of, and he said, look, you gotta tell the king. You gotta tell the king about this. You gotta do something about this because your people are, are, are they're, they're hurting right now. Your people are in trouble right now. They're coming after all of us. And you can't hide, just, you can't just hide. You can't keep your mouth shut when this stuff is going down. It's like, you gotta say something, Jacob, right? Because that would be basically our story too. You gotta speak up. You gotta tell people. You gotta tell people to seek the king, go to the king, go to God, say, Lord, what is your will? What do you want me to do? And doing this show was God's will for me because I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking about this. I mean, I, I had an off, I did a show a couple of years ago with um, Jared Kushner and Ivanka. They actually made hamantash and cookies, which is, uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a treat. It's a great dessert. And uh, we're going to get into what it means in a moment. But they brought it out to the press. It was kind of like a peace offering, which was ironic because I talked about how the symbolism of it, you know, the press was basically their enemy at the time. The enemy, the enemy of the administration. They were the enemy. And so here they're serving Hamantaschen, Haman's ears, actually. But we'll get to that in a moment. But I had briefly thought about that video that I did a couple of years ago, which, by the way, took place, the Purim on that year took place on a worm moon, which was interesting because I tied that into my own life. I tied that into the story of Jacob where he felt like a worm, right? But after two days, on the third day, this is a good thing. So here we are uh, in the third year, this is a good thing. No longer a worm, right? No longer a worm, it's time to rise. So I had been thinking about that out of the blue and then my buddy Ernie calls me up and he's like, you know, I was looking at the, uh, I was just reading in the Bible and Queen Vashti came, and you know Queen Vashti? And I'm like, yeah, I think I do. And for some reason, it was escaping me. And so as I'm on the phone with Ernie, I'm looking things up, and then I see Vashti, and I go, oh, 
I said, oh my goodness, I was just thinking about Purim. And I said, oh, I gotta find out when Purim is because I had forgotten that, you know, March 7th is usually the, uh, the date around there at least. And I look it up and I'm like, it's coming up. And then I read it more and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is what's happening today. And the end of the story, which I'm gonna get to in a second, is what's gonna come for all of us. And that's exciting, big time exciting. press secretary he likes to say I'm gonna circle back so let me circle back let me circle back to Mordecai for a second now Mordecai didn't go to the uh, big parties or anything else he actually was there one day when two of the eunuchs that were supposed to stand guard outside of the king's bedroom where they were so angry at the king they're like they were plotting to kill him Mordecai overheard it and sent the message to Esther said look you know you got to do something about this the king's gonna get toast and saved saved his life. They 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 research it turned out Mordecai, you know, saved the king's life. Now the king probably didn't know anything about it, but it went into the book of records, right? Because anything that has to do with the royals, you know, the lineage, it goes into the book of records. Everything's written down. So any royal family member that maybe did something, it would be in a book somewhere. Okay? So we could easily find out if they did some bad stuff. But this was the same for um King Ashuerus was, you know, he, he, Mordecai was probably the reason why he was alive. So let's get back to, I, I had to, I had to circle back and remind you of that because that happened a little, a little bit prior to Haman finally saying, let's wipe out all the Jews. Hmm. So he gets the okay and it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. Esther gets the news from Mordecai. You better talk to the king. You better try to get the king on my side. You know, you better get the king to see that, you know, that we, we uh, that, you know, can't really hide, can't hide anymore, Esther, because they're going to come for you next, right? You can't keep your mouth shut because they're going to come for you next. So you got to do something now while you have a chance. So Esther sends back word and says, look, I can't. He hasn't called me for um, a month. See, there was a deal. You can't just approach the king. You can't just go to the king you know, unannounced. Like if the king doesn't call you, you can't just go into the throne room and just make your demands. He'll kill you. You're dead. That's like a, a law. The only way to get around it is if he, he puts out his scepter, his golden scepter, and, uh, and then you come over and you touch it. So he allows it. So Esther like says to Mordecai, I can't do that. And then Mordecai's like, you, you, you should do it. And <laughs> just stop being a baby. All right. <laughs> it's okay. You can save a lot of people but you can't save yourself, so you might as well do it. So Esther goes to the king, right? Goes into the king, and I uh, was all nervous, and the king puts out the scepter, because he liked Esther. It was his favorite. It's the only queen that probably said, whatever you want for me, Lord. That's, I mean, that's, that's a good bride, right? Especially if the king is the supreme one that is in charge of everything. So that you understand that no matter what happens in your life, that God is in charge of it. And that you're okay with it, whatever your will for me, even though it's not pleasant at the time. I know, Lord, that your will is better than my will because it's going to lead to a wonderful, beautiful banquet. Celebration. An infinite celebration of unity and truth and love and peace and joy and power and the Holy Spirit. So she comes in and the king says... Make your request known to me, Esther. What is it that you want from the king? I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. And Esther's like, okay, this is what I want. If you really want to give this to me, that's great. Let me prepare, I'm, because I'm so grateful, let me prepare a big feast for you. For you alone. And 
Bring your number one guy, Hammond. Bring your number one guy. I want him to come too. The king's like, okay. So he says, summon Hammond. And Hammond's all excited. It's like the queen's inviting me to a banquet. Hammond's already, the, you know, I'm in charge. I can do this. I can do that. I just write with a swoop of my pen. I got to, I could just, I could just order everything because the king has given me permission to do whatever I want, including torment people or ruin people that perhaps see things a bit differently than me. Sound familiar? So Hammond's all fired up, right? He goes to the banquet, he's psyched. And uh, Esther comes in and the king's like, okay, what is it? And then Esther says, do me a favor. If it pleases the king, let me prepare another feast for you tomorrow. Let me do another one for you. And then I will tell you, I will make my request known. So the king's like, okay. And of course, Haman's gonna come too. Just the two of you, right? I wanna take care of both of you. Right? Esther's got a plan. She's got a plan. She invites both the king and the enemy of her people to this second feast as well. Now, Haman walks out, and Haman's so super excited. He's like, yes, it's the best. I'm awesome. The queen pulled me in. The king's got me. I'm so powerful. And as he's leaving, there's Mordecai. He doesn't bow like the rest of them. And he's like, you just took the wind out of my sails, Mordecai, you son of a gun. Oh, I'm going to wipe all of you out. I can't even stand the sight of you. He goes home and he talks to his family. And he's got like 10 sons. He's got a big family. He tells his wife and he tells everybody. He's like, look at how great I am. But you know what? The queen even invited me to a banquet. But it means nothing if I got this, this guy, this Mordecai, this, he mocks me. It's like, it means nothing as long as he's alive. And they're like, this is what you should do. You should hang them. You should kill them. Build a gallows. Have a gallows made. Have them put to death on the gallows. And then go to the banquet. And he's like, Haman's like, yeah, that's a great idea, right? Carnal man. Human. Haman. Beast system. Wants to put an end to the truth of God. To morality. To peace. To joy. To prosperity. Right? <sighs> Because it's greed, it's lasciviousness, it's lust. It's, Hammond's not a good dude. Not a good dude. So Hammond orders the, uh, the gallows to be made. And um, see, the problem is that night, the king has a little problem falling asleep. He's, he's like, you know what? Bring me the book of records. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like going through a photo album. You want to go through a photo album. It's like, oh, I want to know all the exploits of my kingdom. And I want to hear everything about me. Maybe it'll put me to sleep. So he brings the book of records and he, he learns about Mordecai. He's like, this guy saved my life? How come nobody told me about this? He says. He's like, did we honor him? Did we do something nice for him? Everybody's like, no, no, King. We didn't, you know, he didn't ask for anything. He, you know, he didn't, we just put it in a book. He's like, I'm alive because of this guy and we did nothing. Okay. Haman's called in and, uh, and the king sits back. He's like, what should I do for a person that has honored me and I want to honor them in the highest way? What should I do? Now, Haman's so cocky, so arrogant, such an egotist. He thinks it's all about him. He thinks the king's asking him. Haman, what a meathead, right? What a meatball. So Haman's like, this is what you should do, king. You should get your royal robe and you, you, you put it on him. Get one of your horses, one of your, your great steeds, and have them ride it with the signet on it. And then you should have people shout, this is the man that the king honors. This is the man that the king honors. And parade him through your kingdom. That's what you should do, king. Yeah. Hammond's thinking it's all about him. So the king says, good. Go do this to Mordecai. This is where it gets interesting, folks. You see, right now, a lot of people think that uh, it's not looking too good for them. You see, right now, a lot of people are thinking, Uranus is a planet, by the way. You can get a mug in the uh, description. A lot of people are thinking that it's not looking good. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, right? And yet, even though the system was against Esther's people, even though 
the one guy that hated the other guy so much that he wanted him to be hung on a gallows, the king made him put on a royal rope, put him on a steed, and drag him through the town, humming himself having to say, this is the one who the king honors. This is the guy that the king wants to honor and reward. Could you imagine how that must have felt? The person you hate the most for no reason, just because they wouldn't, he wouldn't bend his knee to carnal will. He wouldn't do it, you know? He didn't wanna do it. It's kinda like, you know, people today, right? Some people, they don't wanna do the certain things that they have to do. I say as long as it doesn't hurt another person, you should do things because you should always seek to have unity and peace and joy. And you should just trust in God that things are gonna, they're gonna be revealed and, and uh, the truth is gonna be known. And God, even though you may be persecuted right now, is gonna reward you openly by your enemy. That's one of the Psalms, one of the beautiful Psalms. He prepares before me in the presence of my enemies a table, right? People that want to see you do bad, people that want to see you hurt, all of a sudden you're promoted. All of a sudden they got to throw you a party at work. People that hate you the most because their boss is like, you got you to gotta honor this guy. King says, you got to honor Mordecai. Haman, who wants Mordecai dead, who has a gallows built for him, has to parade him through the town. And he does. And when all that's said and done, guess what happens? He's even more excited to put the Jews to death now, right? He wants, he wants them done. He wants them toast. And then he comes to the banquet. Comes to the second banquet. And Esther tells the truth. All right, king, you want to know? Well, you love me. You say you want to give me everything. Well, I just want my life. Will you... Please spare my life. The king's like, what are you talking about? There is someone that wants me and my people dead. Wants me put to death. Wants to destroy us. For what reason? And the king is like, this cannot be so. Who is it? Haman. Evil Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Now, what's ironic about all this, this is where you get the name Perm from, right? These people were so careless. They're like, what are we going to do? When are we going to kill the Jews? They cast lots. You're like, let's just throw it down. Let's just pick a date. Let's throw a dart. Let's throw a dart at the dartboard, a calendar, and whatever it lands on, that's when we'll kill them. And it turned out to be March 7th. It was casting lots. Everything's about what they call coincidence or chance, but nothing, everything works together for the good of those that love the Lord. Everything works together perfectly. Esther was where she needed to be. Mordecai was where he needed to be to overhear the plot. Haman was where he needed to be. Everybody fell into place exactly so that the king's ruling would be fulfilled in the land and that the children of the kingdom, the chosen of God, the people of the kingdom of God would be spared. So the king was so angry and he said, what? Who would want you dead? Him? That's it. And this, the king storms out of the room and he's angry and he's like thinking, what am I going to do? This is my most trusted guy. This is the guy that I put in charge of like, you know, the, the UN. <laughs> this is the guy that's in charge of like the world right now. This is the guy that I allowed to be brought up for what reason? <laughs> to be destroyed ultimately, to be humbled ultimately, so that the Esters of the world, those that didn't refuse to come to the banquet, would be rewarded and exalted, while their enemies would be pff, no more, no more. So King runs out of the room, he's so angry. And Haman's like pleading for his life. He's like, well, forgive me, Esther, please forgive me. And at the time he kind of like falls on the couch and it looks like he's like, it looks like he's falling on her. And the King comes in, he's like, you're gonna also try to, what are you doing to my wife? You're trying to, and that was it for him. And then he found out that, that he had built the gallows for, for her uncle, Mordecai. And he's like, hang him, hang him. And that's what happens. But that's not the end of the story, okay? Because you just can't take off the head. You got to get rid of 
all of the, uh, the seed too. So Esther comes back to the king and the king says, okay, what do you want now? He's like, I want my people, this is important people, listen, to be able to defend themselves. I want my people to have the power to get rid of their enemies. If their enemies want them gone, I want them to have the power to stop it. And I want all of Hammond's kids dead. <laughs> it was like the other thing. It like 10 kids. So of course, puts them, they, they put them down and the decree is sent out, right? The decree is sent out because once the, uh, the king makes a decree, you can't, unless the king revokes it, it can't be changed. And so Esther comes back another time and says, do me a favor, will you revoke the whole thing about destroying the Jews for good? Will you please? And he does. And then they're given permission to defend themselves. They're given permission to rise up. And, and they were so powerful and so feared because they had the king's ear, because they had God, the supreme one, the one and only true God on their side, that all their enemies were so scared that nobody messed with them anymore. It's a beautiful story. And they celebrated, they celebrated Purim. Because by lots, the day was cast that they'd all be destroyed. And by chance and coincidence and God's hand, they were miraculously delivered. And it was a decree that for every year it would be celebrated. And how is it celebrated? To this day, um, when you celebrate Purim, you need to read the Megillah, which is the scroll, which is the book of Esther, in the morning. And as a, at night, it needs to be heard. Why does it need to be heard? Because you need to know that regardless of if the whole world is coming against you, you're going to be put on the king's horse and paraded through and exalted. And your enemies are not going to have any more power over you because the Lord is your salvation. Because you said, not my will, but thine be done. Because you asked for the truth no matter what the cost, and you didn't want to stick around with your other nonsense. <sighs> Focused on all your nonsense. You know, it's ironic. Because, you know, I worked in Christian TV for a long time. I don't want to, I don't want to slight them. There are a lot of people, you know, we, we all talk about all this stuff and, and, and I see even there's a, uh, there's a uh, YouTuber that I talk about here and there. And I said, you know, on Twitter, I said I was going to shout them out, but I, you know, I'm not too sure because I think, you know what, these people, they, I think they have a feeling somehow that someone like myself, you know, well, you're not part of the system, right? You're not like the Queen Vashtis of the world. You're like, like some weird YouTuber, that's all you are. You're not a pastor. You don't have a church. You don't collect tithe. But I do thank you for uh, those uh, Patreon. I do thank those people that do support the channel. That means a lot. I do. Sharing, liking, commenting, it's huge. Because all I want to do is God's will. That's all I want to do. I want to inspire and I want to encourage. But I saw, as I'm doing this show, I saw, you know, the, he, the, the book of Esther. And it's ironic but yet here we are once again. You have another person out there who is, it seems to be hearing the same thing that I'm hearing, right? Well, I'm sure there are other people too, but these are just people that I am familiar with on YouTube, much bigger audience than mine. So I'm like, hey man, you know, maybe we should get together. We should talk about this because see, I see maybe a different outcome. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know exactly how things are going to go, but I maybe see a different outcome. But I do see how Haman is on the throne right now. I do see that Haman is in charge right now, and I do see there is great persecution that is also coming. And I do see that the people, people of faith even, people that have morality even, people that just, you know, I mean, you look at the system, you look at what's happening in other countries where anybody who's just, you know, that declares themselves to be a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, it happens to every faith. Anybody that puts their faith in more than Haman, Right? Today would be like putting your faith in Biden and the, you know, and, and the Senate. You know, if you don't worship them, pfft, seems like they're going to want you, you know, kaput. But the fact that this message came to me at the time it did, I can't help but think that the day is coming where God's people are going to be restored. Now, why is this something that I feel? Back to two years ago with this video.
which happens to be a live stream, ironically. I talk about how Jared Kushner and Ivanka, that they prepared these, these uh, delicious desserts. They're called hamantaschen. They look like ears. Take a look. Haman's ears. They eat them, right? Because it was the enemy of the people. And it's become like a tradition. It's become a tradition to remind everybody of the day of Purim. This is what we get Yom Kippur for. Yom Kippur is the new year, but it's supposed to be like as it is on Purim or, or, or celebrate like it's Purim. They don't really celebrate that way. They celebrate with fasting and other things. It's a little strange, but celebrate like it's Purim. Like you just were released from bondage. You were just set free from the gallows. Celebrate like that. That's why today they put on their costumes and they party and they have a good thing. But so Ivanka and Jared, now they're Orthodox, right? So they prepared all these hamantaschen cookies. And I thought it was so strange because they were giving it to the reporters who they considered their enemy. And it was almost like I was looking at two years ago, a picture of them handing over the hamantaschen cookies as like a symbol, like one day you're gonna get your just desserts. One day, you know, whether it's the fake news media or whatever you want to call it, one day, the system, you're going to get your just desserts. And it's happening everywhere. The whole system is falling down. We see corruption like you wouldn't believe. I remember years ago when I did this, this video and I was praying, I'm like, that there be corruption revealed in this, corruption revealed in that, that people's eyes would be opened. And, and here we are today. Here we are today. It's almost like every institution corruption everywhere and everybody's so scared but yet i know as perhaps mordecai knew maybe he didn't know he was probably scared but i know that god's got a plan and it is a plan that regardless of what's coming against us regardless of how things seem to be as long as you are going to the king and saying lord your will my, not mine be done he's not going to want anybody to mess with you you get what I'm saying? So, this is an important thing because Purim is coming. It's coming very shortly. And I wouldn't doubt that we see within the next couple of weeks something beautiful and huge and dramatic taking place in the world. Something of that ilk, of Haman's ilk, where perhaps those people that right now are pointing fingers, those people that are right now trying to silence this and silence that, that perhaps things are already in motion. The banquet's here, Esther's here, and Esther's like, King, do me a favor, will you? Will you save us? That's what I'm praying. Will you deliver us? And the Lord is like, oh, I can't believe I let these guys in charge. <laughs> I love each and every one of you. I hope this beautiful story of Esther, the Megillah, the scroll, whatever you want to call it, I hope it inspired you. I hope you understand the day that we're in because it's literally playing out. It's literally playing out. All we have to wait for right now is um, the sweet dessert that awaits those that come against God's chosen, God's people. And that's a lot of you. So do me a favor. Share the video around, tell your friends, because this is an encouraging word, because God is all that's real. God is the only thing that matters. Faith is the only way out. God is your only salvation. And life gets a lot better when you, uh, you, know, you, you come to the king. It really does. He's going to get you ready. But when you're ready, oh, God, you're going to smell nice. You're going to look nice. You're going to feel great. <laughs> it's going to be a good day. So I love each and every one of you, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching Jacob Israel. Please hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, and share this channel around. If these shows have helped you, help Jacob to reach more any way you can, and have the best day ever. Click it.